Welcome to Urban Dharma, the podcast, where suffering is optional. Hi, this is Reverend Kusla coming to you from downtown Los Angeles, from the International Buddhist Meditation Center in the heart of Koreatown. It's another hot and humid day. It's about 10.30 in the morning and about 90 degrees. But yesterday, I went out to Simi Valley and gave a presentation at One Spirit Center for Conscious Living. My friend, Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones, invited me to speak. And my presentation was on happiness in Buddhism. I also did my very first song, The Eve of Destruction. And I played a harmonica solo in the key of G. So what you're about to hear is a multifaceted presentation at One Spirit Center for Conscious Living in Simi Valley, California. I'm going to talk about happiness today. And I'm going to talk about the Buddhist perspective on happiness. And I oftentimes explain Buddhism in this way. If I'm speaking to people under 30, I talk about how to be happy. And if I'm speaking to people over 30, I talk about how not to suffer. (laughs) But it's, it's the same thing. So today I'm going to talk about happiness. And what is Buddhist happiness? Is it different from other kinds of happiness? And as it turns out, it is. I'd like to read just a couple sentences to get us started. About 10 years ago, after a seminar was held in a Buddhist temple in Seattle, a university student approached the Buddhist priest and said, I am writing a paper on human happiness. I'm comparing various religious definitions of happiness. Could you give me the Buddhist definition. The priest said, if you can forget your individual happiness, that's the happiness defined in Buddhism. So the question comes, well, what the heck does that mean? You know? And so I think it works like this. I thought back to when I was a young fellow I thought back to 1956, 1957. Those were some pretty good years. And I remember being with my dad, watching the original Superman, George Reeves, Noel Neal. And for your information, the third season is out on DVD. (laughs) So... So if you missed it the first time around, you now have another opportunity. And I can remember talking to my mom saying, Mom, I really want to get a Superman outfit. I want to wear the cape. I want to fly around just like Superman does. And my mother went to the store and bought me a Superman outfit. And I was so proud. I wore that everywhere I went. I probably made her feel uncomfortable, (laughs) but I was feeling good. I had true happiness when I had my Superman outfit on. And then a couple years after that, I remember Fess Parker, Davy Crockett. (laughs) And all I could think of was, I want a coonskin cap. So one of my birthdays, my folks again were kind to me and gave me a coonskin cap. And I wore that little guy everywhere I went. I was so happy. I felt so good. And so as I look back in my life, I started to realize that initially my happiness was found in things. If I had the right things, they made me happy. And if I didn't have the right things, I had an excuse to be unhappy. Well, that worked for a while, but then I became sort of egocentric and self-aware. And I was wondering, well, what would really make me feel happy? What would make myself 
feel happy? Is there happiness in self? Can I be happy with self? And I thought back to around 1978, 1979. I was 28 years old. I realized for the first time in my life that I was mortal and would be dead soon. <laughs> because I was approaching 30, and nobody lived long <laughs> after 30. There was a wonderful movie out called Logan's Run, and, and they started to blink, you know, when you turned 30, and then they found you. So they had a very young culture. And I thought to myself, what can I do to make me happy with me? And I joined the gym, and I started to work out with weights, and I started to bench press and do curls, and... I started to feel better about myself. Myself now made me happy. And when I turned 30, I found a meditation center, and I started to meditate. And I started to explore who I was. And that made me happy for a while. But then I saw some stuff in there that I hadn't expected. Is that part of me as well? Well, that doesn't make me happy. I don't want to be like that. I want to be different than that. I want to be better than that. So what do I need to do? Well, it seemed to me at that point, I needed to find a religion. I needed to find a spiritual path. And I had been born a Lutheran, and that had been fine for a while, and then I had become an agnostic, and that was okay for a while because it allowed me to be the nonconformist I thought I needed to be until I realized I was conforming to everybody else who wanted to be a nonconformist. But then I saw the importance of religion and I saw the importance of spirituality. And some people aren't religious, but they're spiritual. And some people are very religious and they're not spiritual. And so I wanted to be both. And Buddhism allowed me to do that. But Buddhism said, if you don't want to suffer, and they always come at you in sort of a negative way, you know, they always say, if you don't want to suffer, which now means if you want to be happy, there are a couple things you got to do, first of all. And the first thing you need to do is practice the five precepts. You really need to start changing the way you speak and the way you act if you want to be happy. I thought, well, what an interesting concept that is. Changing the way I speak and changing the way I act. The five precepts are to avoid taking life, to avoid taking what is not given, to avoid sexual misconduct, to avoid lying, and to avoid consuming intoxicants. Now, I use to avoid in a very special way. Because Buddhism, after all is said and done, is a practice. It is a raft. It is a vehicle for liberation, for freedom, for true freedom. But it assumes that you're not there yet. It assumes you need to do a few things. You need to practice and eventually that practice will turn into performance. And then you don't need to practice anymore. Because you have become it. And it has become you. So I said to myself, if I really want to be different, if I really want to be happy with myself, I need to practice those five precepts. And then I started to realize when I practice those five precepts, other people are happy with me too. Wow. So there's just more than me in this. Everybody else is in there with me. And everybody simply wants to be happy, I find. But most of us don't know how to do it very skillfully yet. Now, I have a motorcycle. That makes me really happy. <laughs> so, I haven't given up all my things. 
because those things still make me happy. And I am sometimes happy with myself when I am skillful and see that other people are more comfortable with me because I am skillful. That makes me happy as well. But we're not there yet, according to Buddhism. Those are just the first two levels of happiness. We're going to talk now about the ultimate level of happiness. But this happiness isn't for everybody. This happiness requires a foundation to be built. It requires us to look at those things that make us happy and realize those things do not have happiness in them. That happiness, rather than being in the thing, is in us. And that thing turns out to be the button or the catalyst or the reason that we become aware of our own inherent happiness. It's already there. From the moment we're born, we have the potential to be happy. But initially, we looked out there to find our happiness, and that out there connected with in here, and we were happy, and we got confused, thinking that perhaps the motorcycle made us happy rather than the motorcycle allowed us to see the happiness that was already there. And now we come to the second place of understanding if I really want to be happy, I, if I really want to be happy, I need to investigate who I am. Who is the thing that feels happy? Where does that exist? What does it look like? Does it have a smell or a taste or a sound or a sight connected to it? Can I find that place inside of me that only is happiness? And is myself, my ego, my self-image connected to that in any real way? And Buddhism is an investigation of who we really are. And we take ourselves apart physically and mentally. And we look carefully. And what we come up with is emptiness. There's no one there. Now, that can be a little disconcerting <laughs> to want to really find out who you truly are and find out that you aren't anything at all. You are simply a process a conditional process that manifests and arises moment by moment, and then it exists, and then it dies. And then there's another process that is born and exists and dies. And if you look carefully in the process, you can't find any one. You find many that are connected. And I thought to myself, isn't this odd? Because who's speaking? Who was invited to come here today? I'm glad he showed up and had something to say. I thought back to all my incarnations in just this lifetime. People get confused when they come to Buddhism and they see rebirth. They don't believe in rebirth sometimes because they've never experienced it. But I say don't look to the future. Don't look to after you die. Look right now at your life. How many times have you been reborn in just this lifetime? Do you have a picture of yourself when you were 10 and 20 and 30 and 40? Is that the same person? Absolutely not. Those people are dead and gone. When I look at that 10-year-old boy, I'm happy he was here because he's the reason I'm here today. But that 10-year-old boy no longer exists. It's sort of like a relay race, I suppose. <laughs> and at certain parts of our life, we just hand off the baton to the next person. <laughs> and then we keep running until our little segment is over, and then we hand off again. Sometimes we drop the baton, have to stop, pick it up. Sometimes we forget which direction to run in. <laughs> uh, 
But there are different people in our life, and all those different people are us in a very special way, and none of us in a very special way. So we have to be somebody, that's for sure. We can't just say, I'm everybody. We need to identify ourselves. We need to make the police department feel comfortable with us. <laughs> we need to be that picture on the driver's license, or the officer will get confused. We need to have a social security number. We need to have all these things that identify us in one or two or three particular ways. But all those things together are who we really are. And this is leading to the ultimate happiness. The ultimate happiness comes when the happiness of others is more important than your own happiness. Because now you've decided there is no one to be happy. There's no one there to be happy. There is just happiness. There is just happiness. And the bodhisattva ideal in Buddhism is this. Through your practice, you come to the direct experience of the interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. You come to see that the ultimate reality in Buddhism defines you as being part of the many, but never separate. We're separate in the relative sense. We're separate in the social sense. We need to have someone there to answer the door. But in the ultimate sense, we're all connected. And we're all interdependent. And when a Buddhist, in their practice, has that experience and then devotes his or her life to the service of others, to making others happiness, an unintended result to that is you are always happy. Because now your happiness does not depend on you. Because there's no you there to be happy. Your happiness now depends on everyone else. And if they're happy, you're happy. So Buddhist happiness is a transcendent happiness. Buddhist happiness is a selfless happiness. Buddhist happiness occurs when the activity of our lives make others feel happy. Make others feel comfortable. Make others feel good. It's an advanced practice. It's not for everybody. But the few who choose to devote their life to service always seem to have a gleam in their eye and a song in their heart. And always seem to make us feel a little better about who we are, even though we're not there. We're still running the race, ready to hand off the baton to the next one. Now, speaking of songs in our heart, I'm going to take a chance today. I came in early today, and I, and I asked the band, I said, would you mind if, if I tried to sort of sing slash talk a song? And they said, well, what song do you want to sling slash talk? <laughs> and I said, I'd, I'd like to do The Eve of Destruction. Now, some of you may not have ever heard of that song. Because that happened in a whole nother era. That happened in like the 60s and the 70s. And some people probably weren't there. And other people probably didn't care. But I read the words of this song, and I thought to myself, it's happening again. This is not the first time. This is never the first time, and it is always the first time. But stuff always seems to go in cycles. And you look at the world today, and you look at CNN, and 
myself, I just look at it and say, what happened? It's running out of control. Where did all this hatred and anger come from? Where did all this delusion come from? And this self-interest. Who's going to win? Are there any winners? I think they're probably just a bunch of losers, huh? So I went online and I downloaded the Eve of Destruction. And I got my little acoustic guitar out and I started to memorize the chords and I started to attempt to sing the song and it brought back all sorts of stuff to me. It brought back the feelings I had when I was a young guy and I was confused about the world around me and how it was supposed to be and how it was turning out to be. And I thought at some point there wasn't any hope at all. And then we got into the 80s and 90s. Hey, it seemed okay for a while. And now we're back in it again. So I'd like to attempt to sing The Eve of Destruction. Stay the same, don't they? Well, now, after talking about how to be happy, let's hear some happy music. And the blues is always happy. The blues is about making 
people who are unhappy feeling good again. So here's a little uh, spontaneous blues in the key of G. <laughs> my talk at One Spirit Center for Conscious Living in Simi Valley, California. Hope you found it interesting, hope you found it useful, and I hope you had a good time listening to it. If you'd like more information on One Spirit in Simi Valley, please visit their website. That's www.onespirit.org. That's www.onespirit.org. If you'd like more information on me, please visit my website, kusala.info k-u-s-a-l-a dot info I've just put together a, a web page of my uh, previous podcasts and included a video interview I did for a local cable television station if you'd like to listen to some of the past podcasts and or see the video please visit dharmatalks.info that's dharmatalks Dot info. And if you'd like to email me, my email address is kusala at urbandharma.org. Well, until the next time, until the next podcast, be happy, be peaceful, and most of all, be free from suffering.